Good morning, everyone. We'll have a slightly shorter talk today because following the talk, we'll have a beautiful discipleship ceremony that we'll all get to be a part of. In the autobiography of a yogi, there's a story there. Yukteswar Giri shares three lessons with Yogananda from his own childhood. He shares three stories. I'm sure many of you remember this. And I was reading this just a few weeks ago. And uh, I want to share the second story. I don't think I can call them stories. I don't know what he calls them. There are incidences or instances from his childhood. And the second story goes thus. He says, my neighbor, when Yukteswar was just a small boy, my neighbor had a dog. And he says it was an ugly dog. And uh, I really liked that dog, and I wanted that dog. And then he says his family offered him other better looking dogs, but he didn't want them. And as you're reading this, you're expecting him to go to the next part of the story. Did he get that dog? Did he get a different dog? But the story ends there. That's all he says. I just wanted an ugly dog that belonged to my neighbor. <laughs> and then he says the moral of the story is that attractive attraction is blinding. It lends an imaginary halo, halo of attractiveness to the object of desire. I'm sure many of you who have read this book have uh, remember this story and the instance. Now, I was reading this, I've read the autobiography of a yogi many times, and I still continue to read it. I read it almost a few times every week, just pages and sections of the book, whatever speaks to me at that moment. And uh, I think I was traveling, and I was reading this story, and I was reminded of an instance from my own childhood. And uh, I can't quite remember all the details. I'm pretty sure it was when I was in middle school. And I was training in classical, Indian classical music at that time. And uh, there was this big music competition that was happening. And I was going to be representing my school or, you know, I was going to be participating in that competition. And it was a very big deal. And, uh, you know, the judges in the competition were the kind of people that I would go and get autographed from. It was really big. And uh, even as I was preparing for it, I kind of knew that my chances were uh, low to none of winning the competition. It was pretty obvious to me. It was just common sense. But I was giving it my best shot. And I don't have any memory of it. I don't know what I sang or how it went. All I remember was you know, when you're on stage, for those of you that are used to it, the lights are blinding. You don't get to see the audience. And I was very, very nervous. And my voice was perhaps shaky. And you know, as expected, I didn't win the competition. But here is the strange thing. I clearly knew I was not going to win. But I was so disappointed. I don't even know why. I was so disappointed, upset, frustrated, angry. I don't know all the things I felt. And you know, I don't have a great memory of all that happened after that. But this is what happened three weeks after that incident. One of my teachers called me. She wanted to speak to me after the class. And we had a really good relationship. And uh, I knew this was nothing. I was not in trouble. And she came up to me and said, you know, I just want you to know that you are, in fact, talented, and you should continue singing. You should not stop singing. And I was hearing all of this, and I recognized when she was saying this that apparently when I was upset, I had told her that I'm never going to sing again. And, uh, <laughs> and she was. You know, she was sharing a lot of wise counsel. But this was the, the confusing part for me in that whole piece, which was that I don't even remember being that upset three weeks ago. And I was sitting there in front of her. I remember thinking, wow, it was so obvious I was not going to win the competition. Why was I so upset? <laughs> it seems to make sense right now as I'm sitting here that it exactly you know, spanned out the way I expected it to. But for some reason, I do remember that I was really, really disappointed and dejected. I was almost confused. I must have been 11 or 12. I don't know how old I was. But more than anything that happened with that competition, or winning or not winning, the confusing part for me was, how did I change my mind? What happened in those three weeks? I was feeling a certain way just three weeks ago. And now I'm feeling so different about this whole picture. And you know. Are my thoughts real? I, don't, I certainly was not as articulate as, as, I, as I am right now, or I don't know what words I used. But there was a little bit of a confusion in my own mind of just thinking, what just happened? Can I believe myself? Why was I feeling that way? Is there a reason? Did something happen to me? And you know, the topic that we are exploring today is the light. And you might be wondering, what is it that I'm even talking about? This light that we are referring to is the divine light. It's obviously not the spotlights or the light that we see. And it has a quality to it. 
It is a light that is totally outside of this plane. It is abstract and it projects all that we see, this entire world, all of it is a projection of this divine light. And what we experience in this world is light and shadow. We are constantly experiencing just the up and down of our own life. And as Yukteswagiri says, the imaginary halo of attractiveness. I was thinking about it yesterday. Both these stories were coming to me. Somehow, whether or not it's obvious to you, it was all related to the topic in my own mind. Because in a sense, if that light is the only reality, if our own reality is that unconditional bliss, everything is imaginary. And we have a lot of imagination. All the thoughts that we have are, in a sense, imaginary. We have imaginary feelings of disappointment, of anger, of anxiety, of sorrow. We go through all of that, and it's real. As Yogananda said, if you hit your dream head with your dream hand in your dream, you still have dream pain. So I'm not discounting the reality of what we experience. But also, in the truest sense, we are told by the masters, when we also know from experience that there isn't as much reality to these things as one might be convinced to believe. There is a line in chapter uh, 30 of Autobiography of a Yogi, again, another chapter. It is called The Law of Miracles. Uh, it is one of my top five chapters. Again, if you are trying to pick a chapter to randomly read within the book, I would highly recommend that one as well. It is on page 270. I don't have the book with me, but I... <laughs> Remember, I was reading it last night. That's why I remember it so well. <laughs> I don't know every single quote from the book. But uh, there is this line that really stuck with me. I kept reading again and again. This was at 11 PM last night. Yogananda says, when one is convinced, or rather, I should let me try to remember this. One's set of values significantly change when he's convinced that this entire universe is a vast motion picture, and not in it, but beyond it lies its own reality. When one is convinced, when, when one understands that what we are seeing, in fact, is a play of light and shadow, it's a motion picture. Motion pictures were really big when Yogananda lived in Southern California in the 40s and the 30s. And he often referred to them. In fact, he would watch these pictures uh, with his disciples, and he would tap on their shoulder as the movie was going on, and he would ask them to look at the projector booth. The light is coming from there, and there is so much happening. There is a war, there is suffering, there is romance, there is songs, there is dance. All of that is going on in front of the screen, but it's all just that one beam of light that is coming from behind. And in that sense, a lot of what we experience, the light just projects. But when we are in this plane of senses, in this world, all that we experience are light and shadow. We experience both. It just goes up and down. And it is fascinating to contemplate on this idea that our thoughts, in fact, are figments of imagination. I was, uh, again, this was all coming together in my head last night because all of these things happened in the last few weeks. As I was reading this story from the autobiography of Yukteswar and the Ugly Dog, and I was thinking about the instance from my own childhood, I saw an ad somewhere on the internet. It was an ad for some kind of suicide prevention organization. And somebody was holding this big board that said, all your thoughts are not real. And you know, of course, it was talking about mental health and you know, just working with oneself when you're not going through a great time. But that statement has a wisdom that is far beyond any particular circumstance or event in our life. All our thoughts are not real. We just experience life in a certain way. And here is what the 12-year-old self did not know when I was going through that experience, which is that the suffering that I experienced, which is real, I did feel dejected, I did feel upset, I was disappointed. I thought it was just a function of I, me, mine. I thought this was just happening to me. Somehow I was going through something, and I had to control it. I had to work with it. There was just this self-preoccupation that is so characteristic of how we suffer. And this reading and this whole idea of the light itself as this universal spiritual phenomenon, common to all traditions, all religions, is presenting this interesting idea that what we experience is not merely a function of who we are, but our relative proximity to the light. 
there is this universal source of light. And when we are farther from it, we experience it as suffering. And when we are drawn closer to it, when the light is closer to us, then somehow the suffering disappears, again in Yogananda's own words, as if it never was. Uh, you know, this light is abstract. It is not something we can comprehend with our senses. Light is something so physical. We are talking about uh, a word that is essentially physical in nature. There is day and night, there is light and darkness that we experience. And yet this divine light, the light that the spiritual teachings talk about in all religions, in all traditions, is not one of the senses. It has many qualities. The first one is that it's abstract. It's not one that we can perceive with our senses. In another chapter from the autobiography of a yogi about the sleepless saint who Yogananda goes to visit, I'm not going to share the whole story with you if you have not read it. Certainly, again, a very fascinating instance from the book. Yogananda is, uh, visits the saint who lives somewhere in rural Bengal, and uh, he finds the saint's hut, and he's going to spend the night uh, with the saint. And in the middle of the night, Yogananda is sitting, and the saint asks him, why are you not going to sleep? And he says, how can I go to sleep? It's like lightning happening in front of my eyes. I'm just surrounded and overwhelmed by this light. And the saint simply says, Oh, you're so blessed. You're fortunate that you can see the spiritual radiations that are coming out of this place. It was coming from that man himself, Ram Gopal. But the lesson there is that we have to train ourselves to see the light. We have to recognize it. It is not something that will always be obvious, but it is always there. I've seen people walk into this temple, and even in our community, I remember once I was just selling a piece of furniture, and somebody from Craigslist came into my apartment, and they were just looking around in our community, for those of you who have been there in Mountain View. It's an interesting place. There's this large green area. There are a lot of plants, and the gardens are beautiful. And this person was just walking around. It was at 6 or 7 p.m. in the evening. It was rather dark. And he looked at me and said, there's so much light in this place. And I was so, you know, I was pleased because, you know, of course, when somebody recognizes that, it's pleasing to you, and you have an immediate connection with that person. This light is always there if we were able to see it, if we were able to recognize it. And part of that own training that we need to uh, you know, go through and that we are trying to tune into within ourselves is simply to be sincere, to receive, to always be open, to always ask, to always look for the light, to always look for Divine Mother's hands and all those experiences. The other quality of this light that it is instantaneous. Um, I don't know what the right English word, I, I was thinking about it today morning. If That doesn't seem like the right word, but I'm still going to use it. There isn't an actual process of scrubbing the darkness away. Yogananda says in one of his quotes, when you turn the lightness, uh, light on in a, in a dark room, the darkness vanishes as though it had never been. When you turn the light, the darkness vanishes. You don't have to scrub each inch of that darkness. Even in that story uh, from that reading, you know, Master's mother is showing Lairi Masha's picture, and Master immediately says, you know, he was uh, stricken with Asiatic cholera, he was having nausea, he couldn't have strength to even get up from his bed, and instantly, all the symptoms disappeared. Suddenly, he had the strength to bow down to his mother. And that's how we often experience it, even in our own lives. When we come closer to that light, all the things that seemed so important that was making us angry, that was making us upset, that was disappointing us, suddenly, we just don't understand why we were even upset about it. Suddenly, when we are lifted into the light, we realize that all the other details were somehow imaginary that we were making it up. We are able to observe it. That's really what happens. Our perspective shifts. It is not, I don't want to minimize the importance of working with human emotions and integrating all of them. I want to be careful in how I say this. But at the same time, we don't work with darkness at the level of darkness. The only way we can work with it is by bringing light into the picture. And that's really how we transform, how even spiritual teachings affect our lives, because it is inside out. I've not mentioned this yet, but this light that we are talking about, we keep referring to it as the light from above or the spiritual light. But it is within all of us. And all we see, even when we recognize it, even as Yogananda was seeing these spiritual radiations from Ram Gopal and his hut, 
It was him recognizing that light within and its reflection outside. This light is always radiating from within. And when we experience it, we, we often don't even notice. That is the interesting part of how transformation happens in our own life. It is a natural response that our heart opens and receives it. And we welcome into our lives gradually to the extent to which we are able. The third, third quality of this light, again, one that this reading makes reference to, is where there is this light, there can be no suffering. You know, there are so many accounts written of people having near-death experiences. When people always, it is a tunnel of light. People see light. And here is the second part, which is so comforting and which is something that is worth meditating on for all of us. As soon as people see the light and they start entering it, everyone has the same experience to share. They see their own life playing in front of them. What does that mean? We become the observer. We are no longer affected. We get to watch the motion picture. It is simply becoming identified with the beam of light that is behind the screen rather than watch what is happening in front of the screen. And that is an experience that almost naturally comes when we become closer to the light, when we come closer to it, that we can watch all of it. The details don't change, but our perspective changes. I had, you know, right when I graduated college, I purchased a very expensive camera. I wanted to tie photography, and photography is all about light, and you're always trying to get the best picture. I was really into nature and landscape and things like that. And you can never get the right picture unless you take photos either in the beginning of the day, early in the morning, or later in the evening when there is just the optimal level of light to capture all details because in the middle of the day when there's a lot of light, things get washed out. And, you know, and then you get this picture and you're editing it in Photoshop or other software applications. You're just trying to uh, you know, spend a lot of time getting each parameter right. And the last few years, you know, there may be people here in this room I can see who don't even know what a camera is when you describe because, you know, didn't you have a phone? <laughs> Why did you have to buy an expensive camera? So nowadays, you can just uh, take your phone and you can edit pictures and all of those functionalities that you needed to have really complicated software for, it's there pretty much on any phone that you can buy from the store. And again, I was editing a picture just a few days ago from one of my recent trips, I, editing as in I was just trying to make it look the way I wanted. And you know, it's just the way the mind works because I've been thinking about light and this reading and all of the <laughs> relationships with that. I was trying to adjust the brightness and the contrast. I'm sure all of you have done this. If not, you can go home and try this today. And try this exercise. I know you, I'm sure you have done this before, but I still recommend it. Just take any picture on your phone and increase the brightness on that picture. The first thing that you will notice, especially increase it to, you know, keep increasing it, go to the maximum, you will see at the 100% when you take it to the farthest end, it's just a white frame. There's nothing there. But as you keep moving that slider, all of the details get washed out. It just starts becoming more and more light. Now, it's not what you want when you're trying to show a photo. And that's, in fact, why God created light and darkness in this world, for it to look the way it looks right now. But really, what's happening spiritually is simply this, that all the details, all the preoccupations, all that which keeps our mind busy just gets washed. As soon as the light enters, it just washes, it just smoothens out everything that somehow seems so dire right in the moment. All the different emotions that we go through, I can tell you, as much as it was a spiritual awakening for me at age 12, it was not the last time I felt a strong hit of emotion. I've had quite a few since then, and uh, you know, by probability, it's likely I might continue to have more. But something has changed in all of it, which is that I, I notice, I become aware. It comes with spiritual awakening. Sometimes it even just comes with age. I was once driving with a very dear friend of mine. She's not on this path. And uh, you know, she has had a lot of adventures and trials in her life. And she was telling me, you know, as you age, all the things that made you angry, all the things that you were upset about, you just don't care about them anymore. And I thought that was just a lot of spiritual wisdom. And then she went on to say, you're so busy with your knee pain and your cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> 
and you're constantly consumed worrying about your own body and taking care of it, that you're not as upset with everything else around. You're not as angry or worried about all the things that you didn't get to do, all the things you wanted to have but you couldn't buy. I mean, those are all still there. They linger. They don't go away. They have just been you know, superseded by more immediate concerns of the body. But if we do spiritually grow, when we do spiritually mature, there's more than that. We actually realize that all the things that I was so obsessed about, all the details that I cared about so much, this thing I wanted exactly this way, this house, I, you know, all the competitions I wanted to win, all the promotions I wanted to have, the car I needed to have, the relationships that I was interested in, all these details somehow start to look trivial. Somehow in the grander scheme of things, they do not weigh the same. They are not as significant in terms of what makes me happy, what makes me feel good. And that is what the light gives us, is when we get closer, it starts to look different. This whole world is just a play of light and shadow, as Yogananda shared. As Keshwa was chanting that chant today, he always is very sweet. He comes and asks me anytime I'm talking, would you like, is there a chant that you would like? And I said, there's so many you know, with light, anything that you pick would be perfect, and it always is. You know, that chant on Divine Mother, who tells me thou art dark? Thousands of suns and moons from thy body do shine. I was uh, reminded as I was listening to that chant from a story from the life of Ramakrishna. It's from his biography. There's a conversation where his disciple, Keshav, again, Keshav Sen, asks Ramakrishna, Master, why is Kali so dark? Why is Divine Mother portrayed in such a dark form? And Ramakrishna gave an interesting answer. He says, she is dark when you look at her from a distance. When you're farther from the light, it looks like darkness because what we're experiencing is just the duality of life itself. But he goes on to say, have you looked at the sky? What color is it? It's blue or gray. But when you go closer to it, you will see that it has no color. Have you looked at the ocean? It looks so blue. Just go, stand in the waves, and take some water in your hands and look at it. Is it blue? Do you see any blue color? You won't. All you will see is crystal clear light. And that's who Kali is. She is just light. And when you go away, when you stand farther from her, you experience it as darkness. And when you get closer, all you see is the light, and everything else fades in the background. All that we need to do in our lives and here is where it comes to how we live these teachings, is constantly try to see the light, recognize it, and tune into it. Because we notice our own perspective starts to shift. Even as I was thinking, you know, looking at these pictures of the gurus, I was meditating today morning, and I was looking at that picture of Yogananda. We keep saying, the light is within me. What am I looking at? What am I looking at when I see my guru's picture? We are just going to have a discipleship ceremony just in a few minutes. And what we are seeing is a reflection of that light, but we need that reflection. That's a recognition. When that pure light of spirit, it's, it does come in form. It's just that we cannot perceive it or recognize it with our senses. It comes in all kinds of forms. It comes as a beautiful mountain, mountains and waterfalls if you feel uplifted in nature. It comes in the form of sacred spaces where you can see the light. It comes in the form of saints and people that are more spiritually mature and advanced than us. We see the light in them. That's what the Bible itself is talking about when it's talking about Christ and the disciples seeing the light. It comes in the form of Yogananda. It comes in the form of Yogananda's picture. What's there in a picture? You know, once I remember for a project, I was printing so many pictures of the master and we were going to cut it and paste it on something. And it almost seems like it was taking the value away from that picture. Now I was staring at so many pictures of my guru. I mean, somehow one picture in itself was so special, but now I was just look, looking at a pile of paper. But really, it is not a pile of paper. What it is, it's a symbol. It's a symbol for the light that is within us. And as we honor it, as we come up to the altar, as we look at anything that is reminding us of that light, it is awakening that light within us. It is drawing us closer to the light. It makes everything else look trivial. It makes all the details of this plane of material life just look relatively of low importance compared to matters of spirit. And that's what engrosses us. That's what ultimately transforms us. 
And that's why we constantly keep referring to the light as much as it is so abstract and it is not the light of the senses, it is not something that we can see with our eyes, we are constantly referring to it, referring to it <coughs> tuning into it. Because ultimately that's what we are inviting into our lives. As we say at the end of blessing, uh, every Sunday at the end of the Festival of Light, may the light of Christ, the infinite consciousness, shine upon you. That's all we are expecting. That's what we are praying for. That's what we are inviting into our lives, for the light of the infinite consciousness of Christ himself to shine upon us, to awaken that light within us, to be able to see that spirit of creation itself, the play of light and shadow, that everything in our lives becomes a reminder for something beautiful, for something better. And when ultimately we enter that tunnel of light, when we are able to observe our whole life as a motion picture, we can just look at it and just say, all this was your play, Divine Mother. I'm just a child of light. God bless you. Oh